I would like to um, to share to open this conversation and um, uh, really welcome very warmly the participants that uh, have come to this webinar today. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome you to a very special special webinar bringing together uh, speakers from three different parts of the world, from China, from South Africa and from uh, Mexico. And to actually engage in a conversation that um, we have seen some uh, discussions around already, but really looking deeper into the digital transformation of higher education and look more specifically at what innovations we see in teaching and learning today. So the speakers will come from a brick and mortar university, from an online university and from um, an online and a brick and mortar university, but they're from a research center. And so these different perspectives will allow to shed again, some different lights on what innovations are being triggered um, due to the pandemic. So the webinar is part of a larger series of webinars on the future of higher education, a series that the IAU was very pleased to launch starting in May 2020. Today, this is the 22nd webinar in the series. And we've touched on many different issues already, um, but from each time, very different perspectives. We've looked at uh, the higher education in the labor markets and the skills, um, the skills education that is being offered at universities and how that is impacted today by COVID-19 as well. We looked from different angles at the transformation of internationalization at higher education right from the start in the beginning of the pandemic. And we saw already how that was changing along the way uh, as we moved um, into the pandemic uh, more seriously over time. We looked at the impact of COVID-19 uh, survey that the IU launched, the first one was in May, and we just launched a second leg of the global survey on the impact of COVID-19. And we also presented the various activities from around the world to actually address the many challenges that we face, but also says the opportunities that are offered to us uh, in our various capacities. We looked at the values-based higher education, at academic freedom, and also the new challenges that arise today, at different modes of deliveries and campus initiatives uh, today and for tomorrow. We certainly also shed some light on uh, Agenda 2030, the SDGs, and how these still have a space and place in our higher education institutions and systems around the world. We looked at future planning, leadership changes. Um, we as well looked at uh, recognition mechanisms. Um, also today, in, in light of the pandemic, we looked at the global uh, convention at UNESCO, the recognition of higher education qualifications and at the role for an IAU, um, since we maintain the World Higher Education Database and what roles we can have in, for the future of recognition as well. We certainly um, each time also look at the uh, very important notion of collaboration instead of competition and um, also the connect between knowledge systems. And that's why we're very pleased today again to be able to bring in some, such a very diverse voices into the conversations. We looked at social impact, um, university models, um, and I will leave it at that. So many topics that are so important today to, to look at more in depth. But uh, before get going anywhere, uh, I would like to now um, give the floor to Trina Jensen, who's the manager of uh, higher education and the digital transformation of higher education. And she's been leading quite a bit of work on um, these different topics at the, um, for the IEU and with the IEU membership at large. And she will um, take over from here and uh, lead uh, us into this uh, very important discussion today. I will come back towards the end of the session. The floor is yours, Trina. Thank you very much, Chilich, and thank you for the opening. I also want to say welcome to the, the participants that are joining us from around the world. We are very excited about this uh, session that we have entitled Digital Dimension Innovations in Teaching and Learning. I think that uh, about a year ago, more or less, was the time where we started to see the world 
changing very rapidly and suddenly and moving into lockdowns lockdowns that really disrupted the functioning of the universities because all of a sudden we needed to have uh, restrictions in terms of physical distancing and what universities are used to is more for social gatherings rather than physical distancing. Of course, the first months following, I think that many universities were in uh, emergency mode in order to, to shift operations in order to be to ensure that the, the operations are continued, that, uh, that teaching and learning is not disrupted. And we believe now that we are one year into to the pandemic, we are still in a situation where we cannot meet uh, with friends, family at, at the universities as we wish. But it is no longer the same situation of emergency mode. We have, we have had the time to, to put in, in place certain measures. And uh, at IAU, we are very impressed uh, to see to what extent universities around the world have been able to respond and find solutions to continue operations despite this difficult time. We have now decided that we want to take the, the conversations uh, to the next level, so not necessarily talking about the emergency mode and how we are shifting, but try to, to extrapolate some of the first lessons learned from this experience and have a conversation about how this kind of world laboratory in the use of uh, digital technologies in higher education will actually impact the future of higher education. And in order to have this type of conversation, we are very uh, proud to have this excellent uh, panel uh, before you. Uh, I will introduce them uh, very shortly, but let me just explain to you first the format, how we're going to run this session. Each of our three panelists will have uh, 10 minutes to make a presentation, to share some of their thoughts about the future of teaching and learning and how this experience will, will impact it. What are the, the opportunities deriving and what are the things that we are actually just looking forward to go to, to do as we did beforehand uh, or a conversation about this. Uh, and then afterwards, we will have time in the second part of the webinar for questions and answers. So we hope that you will submit your questions, your comments in the in the Q&A uh, function as well, so that we can include those uh, in the interactive conversation in the second part. So with no further ado, I will start by moving to China because it's very late and uh, we are very pleased to have Yan Li with us, even though it's almost uh, 10 o'clock, I think, in the evening already. Uh, Yan Li is the professor and director of the Department of Curriculum and Learning Sciences. And she's also the director of the Research Center on Artificial Intelligence in Education at Zhejiang University in China. And today we have not asked the Yan Li to look specifically on artificial intelligence, but to look on what are the, the innovations that she sees in terms of uh, teaching and learning. And in order to do so, I'm quite sure that uh, she has discussed or undertaken a survey, uh, consulted with colleagues across the institution, and she will share some of the findings with us. So Yan Li, we're pleased to have you with us and you have the floor, please. Okay, uh, wait, wait, let me uh, find my, so. so can you see my slide? Yes, I see it. You can just put it in play mode and then it should be running fine. Okay. Like this one? You can see? Yes. The play model. Okay, okay. So good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everyone. <laughs> uh, I feel it's really uh, my honor to be uh, invited here to share uh, some of my research findings and also my personal thoughts uh, about uh, the topic, uh, the uh, digital dimensions, innovations in teaching and learning. Uh, I'm from Zhejiang University, uh, which is located in Hangzhou, China. Uh, it's a very beautiful city. Uh, so next time, I hope, also hope can uh, have uh, some of you come to my university. Uh, 
Yes, just uh, mentioned uh, last year is a very special year for the whole world. So uh, as for the university uh, to uh, cope with COVID-19, actually my university uh, also, actually the time uh, last year now, actually we just started, we are, we are uh, starting the, the, the large scale online, web-based online, uh, 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 business education. So in last uh, three semester, uh, all of our uh, undergraduate courses, undergraduate courses taught online. So here the number. So you can see uh, more than six thousand uh, undergraduate courses, and also about uh, one uh, one thousand and uh, uh, six hundred uh, ninety uh, five uh, graduate courses. Uh, taught uh, online and uh, uh, the number is to our uh, Chinese students and uh, international students like uh, uh, 57,000 uh, our Chinese students including undergrad and graduate and uh, more than 6,000 uh, our international students uh, all, uh, all around the world so uh, in the history of our university <laughs> Like the first time, all courses online. Uh, later, I, I will show. Actually, most of our students they had a very limited online teaching experience. So we last year we actually we learned a lot from from the online teaching. And uh, before the semester uh, started uh, last year, our information technology center. Uh, carried out a teachers training program for all instructors about uh, how to teach on how to teach online and the mainly uh, for maths uh, we have uh, we had uh, three uh, li uh, live teaching I uh, use uh, video conference and also some uh, instructors they will uh, use uh, the recorded the videos and also uh, some will use their MOOC uh, massive op uh, open online courses as a part of their teaching resources. So uh, uh, here is the, uh, the whole picture of last uh, spring semester in our school. So uh, actually in, in um, uh, June last year, uh, almost finished uh, uh, our uh, summer semester, I did uh, two surveys among our uh, students and our uh, instructors groups. So because there are too many students and uh, too many uh, uh, instructors, so uh, we decided to uh, uh, choose one specific uh, college as our target uh, population. Uh, so we select uh, Juke Zheng Honors College. Actually, it is uh, uh, represent the best uh, College in our undergraduate programs, uh, and uh, we choose the undergraduate uh, students as a target of, of population. But uh, you can see we haven't included a, a, a senior because that is the last semester for the senior students. They almost have no courses, mainly they have internship. So we haven't included a senior students. So here is the, our uh, target population and the main research questions. Actually, there are several, uh, several, but I uh, de de deleted for this uh, uh, presentation. So the uh, uh, three main topics, uh, what are students' perceptions of instructors' roles in online courses? What are students' overall feelings about online courses, especially their uh, interaction uh, in class and after class and their overall satisfactory uh, about the online teaching. The last question is, what are students' perceptions about the benefits and the challenges of the online learning? And of course, uh, instructors survey, uh, we also uh, uh, use uh, the target population from uh, uh, the Juke Gen Honor College, uh, totally is uh, 200, uh, almost half filled in the survey. And the main uh, research question is about uh, the technological, pedagogical content, uh, knowledge level of the targeted uh, instructors. So here are some very briefly uh, description about the findings. 
because the limited slides I didn't use. <laughs> so I put mainly a findings here. The, uh, the main findings from students survey, we found that uh, in students' perceptions, more than 80% of course instructors, they have had the following roles, like a uh, course designer, organizer, a discussion facilitator, social supporter, technology, uh, technology facilitator, and assessment designer. Uh, as to the in-class interaction, uh, about one quarter students reported increase, uh, and 28% uh, uh, felt, uh, felt the same as the traditional uh, classroom. Uh, about 47% uh, uh, of students, they reported the in-class interaction decreased. So you can see uh, there are different uh, percentages uh, as to the in-class interaction. And as to the after-class uh, action, also you can see 30% um, uh, feel increased, 21% feel the same, while 40% uh, feel decreased. Uh, as to the uh, overall, uh, the quality of the online courses, uh, about one quarter reported online courses were better than traditional courses. Uh, 28 feel the same, and uh, about uh, uh, 45 reported uh, the traditional courses were better. Uh, so uh, there are, uh, because uh, uh, during last year, many surveys among different uh, uh, countries, different uh, levels of uh, uh, schools, they, uh, they had a diverse uh, findings about uh, uh, similar uh, questions. Uh, as to the learning platform, uh, we use our, our university's own uh, online uh, platform called Learning in CJU. CJU, uh, CJU is, our, my, uh, is my uh, university. So about 70% uh, uh, students, they were satisfied or very satisfied with the learning platform and the Bing talk. Uh, but uh, still, there are 30% uh, of tip, uh, tip to neutral or dissatisfied uh, uh, dissatisfied attitudes. Uh, students perceive the benefits of the online courses. They feel the recorded courses uh, contents uh, can let them repeat uh, repeat the content, and the playback function is very useful. Uh, the the uh, the increased learning ability, uh, self directed learning ability. Uh, the time flexibility also they feel uh, is a good uh, point. Uh, familiar, uh, familiar, uh, familiar with some software, familiar, uh, facilitating communication, get, uh, getting used to web-based learning, and expanded uh, horizon. Uh, they feel the challenges mainly uh, in uh, these areas like self uh, lack of self discipline, uh, limited interaction, uh, visual fatigue. Uh, from the uh, screen, uh, large amount of homework, uh, stability of network, time arrangement, lack of practice, feedback is not in time. So uh, there are uh, the main uh, challenges uh, reported by, by our students. So based on the findings, we suggest uh, the main su su suggestion, uh, we uh, say uh, instructors should add more opportunities for students to interact with others and to uh, practice what uh, students they've learned. And also uh, instructors uh, may do uh, learner analysis before uh, course design, so uh, they can decrease uh, the deep, uh, difficult level of teaching content to keep students having suitable cognitive loading uh, as to the uh, university, university should uh, carry out uh, suitable instructor training programs for better online or blended teaching learning design practice. So here's the uh, results from our students survey. And here's the uh, main findings from our teachers uh, survey. Actually, uh, totally 91 uh, instructors uh, who, uh, who taught courses uh, during last uh, uh, spring and the summer uh, semester for the college. Uh, the first point, actually, for this college, uh, our university assigned uh, almost uh, the best uh, uh, 
instructors from different uh, colleges. Uh, so about 90% of the surveyed instructors, they had more than 10 years college teaching experience. Uh, however, uh, less than 10% indicated that they had a, 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 a rich online teaching experience. So that indicated uh, normally we had a, a very traditionally uh, teaching staff. Uh, according to the uh, TPEC level, uh, surveyed the teachers' uh, scores in non-pedagogical knowledge dimensions, uh, pedagogical content or pedagogical content knowledge, they, uh, they were averagely higher than their scores in technological knowledge uh, dimensions. Um, yeah, and the gender and the age had no significant impact on uh, all dimensions of the uh, survey uh, teachers at the PEC level. And the online teaching experience also had no significant impact on most of the dimensions of the survey uh, teachers at the PEC level. Uh, however, it had a significant impact on teachers' uh, technological knowledge level. Uh, the implication is, uh, I feel, uh, after uh, getting the results, I feel uh, there is a long road to go for our university to increase our teachers' uh, TPEC level, and uh, uh, then they can uh, have more confidence to carry out online education with high quality. And uh, at, uh, present, uh, at present, most of the teachers, they might have uh, basic knowledge about how to uh, use online platform, how to teach online. However, uh, they need more skills to guide the students' uh, learning online. And the teachers' knowledge about uh, using all kinds of tools to strengthen teacher-student communication, to carry out a more diverse online activities, and to encourage students' higher level thinking uh, might be eagerly need, uh, needed for future uh, online or blended teaching. So here I uh, uh, gave uh, two suggestions. The first one is more online teaching related workshops could be carried out to let college teachers have more learning by doing opportunities. Uh, and another one is the universities might do deeper learning analysis based on big data accumulated in learning platform and make the results to be known among college students to, to guide uh, teachers uh, their reflect about their teaching behavior. Uh, the last slide. Uh, so uh, besides the suggestions based on my two surveys, uh, here actually the suggestions for uh, teaching learning models in the future based on the latest uh, Horizon report. And the first one is uh, integrating uh, emerging uh, technologies and uh, practices in, uh, in higher education, uh, the teaching and the learning, like uh, using uh, adaptive learning technologies and including uh, AI machine learning education applications uh, analytics for student success and the promotion of instructional design, learning engineering, and uh, user experience design, uh, better uh, use of open educational uh, resources, and also there are a more uh, uh, mixed uh, reality technologies uh, will be available, so we need to improve those uh, those uh, emerging uh, technologies. Uh, however, uh, just uh, one or two weeks ago, the latest uh, Horizon report uh, issued, and uh, the topic is about uh, information security. Uh, security. So uh, I think uh, in the future, also we uh, should pay attention to this issue: uh, how to uh, preserving data authorities. Are integrated and still how to uh, uh, deal with students' uh, data uh, privacy uh, governance and uh, also about our uh, university's uh, uh, researchers' uh, security and uh, uh, using AI. We need to pay attention to the ethics question uh, uh, issues. So here's my presentation and uh, hope it can help uh, all of you to understand the. Um, the situations that happened in uh, Chinese university last year. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Lee, for your, your presentation. Very interesting indeed that you share these findings with you uh, based on the, the research that you conduct or this consultation. And also interesting to see these uh, divergent uh, trends that some are more pleased with online, others are less pleased. And I think that it's also a matter of uh, for different people, different types of learning uh, could be more or less useful. So thank you very much for your presentation. We look forward to discussing further you, with you uh, as we move along. But uh, with no further ado, I will now turn to South Africa. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Laura Cianovic. I hope I pronounced it correctly, Laura, otherwise you will correct me. Uh, Laura is professor and director of the Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So innovation in teaching and learning is not you, uh, new to you, Laura, but it will be interesting to hear from you as well what you have taken out of this experience during the pandemic and how you see trends moving forward. So I, it's my pleasure to give you the floor. You are muted still, so you will have to unmute, but I see your screen is shared. You just have to play, play the PowerPoint and we should be good. Okay, can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Fabulous. Um, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I think that um, these kinds of webinars I was saying earlier have turned out to be one of the few pluses of this terrible time that um, we, are, we are finding ourselves able to have these conversations across countries with all sorts of people and that people are actually quite comfortable having these conversations. And I didn't include it as one of the things to take forward, but in fact, I hope it's one of the things that we take forward. Okay, so um, can you see my screen in full? Yes. Uh, yes, now it plays. Now it's fine. So just now you're okay. all set to go. So first of all, just to say that the slides are um, online. Um, that's the bit.ly link. And uh, the reason I also put them online is that I have linked to some um, references that I think people might find useful. So you will have those references and you don't need to take screenshots or whatever while I'm talking. And I've also included my Twitter handle for those of you who are on Twitter and want to share any of the links and so on. So uh, Trina, I followed your instructions very closely. Um, you, you sent us the instructions and I am um, answering your questions. So the first thing that you asked was, is the increased use of digital technologies a temporary measure to curb the spread of the virus? And my answer is no, it is not temporary. And it has catalyzed higher education into digitally mediated society as a whole. And some people would argue that society has been way ahead of higher education. So I come from a very traditional residential research intensive university, one of the top 200 by all the rankings, etc. And so there the unique selling point is the residential experience. Cape Town is very beautiful. So many people want to come to Cape Town. And there is an argument that in fact, universities such as this type of university have, have been really not taking these issues and implications that seriously. So you asked, are we discovering new opportunities to enhance the quality of teaching and learning in the Yes, definitely, we are. But before I talk about those opportunities, I do feel obliged to talk about the dangers. And I was mindful that you wanted me to talk about opportunities, but it would be remiss to, to not mention the dangers. So I won't dwell on them, um, but I do, I, I, write, I, I started a blog this year. It was one of my New Year's resolutions, in fact, to, to start blogging and to start blogging about some of these dangers. So I think I've managed to do about four or five blog posts this year. And the theme of these uh, postings is about what I'm calling new forms of coloniality. 
in other words, not colonialism, because colonial, colonialism was nation and geographical and time bound, but coloniality in the sense of colonial practices. And what has happened as a result, partly of the digitization of society and higher education combined with the rise of neoliberalism and with um, global inequality has been a number of practices primarily the central goals of profit making and market expansion. And so we've seen in higher education a number of um, very big investments made um, in higher education, which are made for the purposes of profit making. Um, we're also seeing growing exploitation of natural resources and human beings through surveillance and data colonialism. We're seeing this kind of buy-in to improvement through shared belief systems. So I don't know about where all the participants come from, but the fourth industrial revolution is a big discourse, very um, powerful discourse in my part, part of the world. And a notion that assimilation is necessary. So if you're not buying into these discourses, you are somehow being left behind. But in fact, all of this is premised on and amplifying and engendering inequality. But Trina, you asked me to talk about opportunities. So I'm including the link to the, the blog posts that I've started writing about, which are really my concerns about the serious risks um, that we have seen. But what lessons have we learned in the last year? And I would say probably the number one lesson, the one number one exposure has been that we've seen the hidden inequality that has been the foundation of higher education and it's been exposed by COVID. Because residential universities in particular, and I'll be interested in what Francisco has to say, because his context is very different, but residential universities who have campus-based infrastructure, residences, computer labs, and so on, are able to mask or alleviate or hide or counter, depending on your perspective, the kinds of inequalities of the students and where they come from, and even the academics and where they come from. And that became impossible the moment everyone went home. And even in elite universities, my university doesn't like to call itself elite because, you know, that's got some negative associations. But even in a university like ours, there have been students who have gone home to very serious poverty. And we have seen what happens when you are exposed to the inequalities of students' backgrounds and what that, um, what that means. And once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. Oh, I hope that we can't unsee it. I hope that we will go into the future having taken on what we have come to see. Um, I've included a link there, which is a, a paper that uh, we wrote together with 16 universities where we explored how inequality has been manifest during, in fact, it was the first through three months of the pandemic. The, the many ways, I think we had nine themes of how inequality um, was exposed and we gave voice to the people who contributed their experiences. So that link uh, may be of interest. But to be more optimistic, I would say that what we have learned that will be useful for the future of teaching and learning is that we have learned that it is possible to design for inclusion. Um, and for many of us who've been working in, in, in teaching and learning, in higher education development, we've known that, but getting decision makers attention um, has been really difficult. And one of the things that I think has happened as a result of the this period is that the centers for teaching and learning have come to the forefront of universities in ways that they had never been before. I think they were often considered peripheral or marginal and they were always struggling for funding. Whereas now arguably those centers and our centers are really being seen as enormous contributors to changing pedagogy and to inclusion. And it's really quite encouraging to see the number of resources that have emerged around designing for equity first. And this is why I included the slides, because here is a selection of resources from 
a number of places, including some quite big one. The first one is a really big study, um, and some of them are quite are smaller. But what we've seen is suddenly this is an issue. Suddenly this is getting attention. And these resources are incredibly helpful for thinking about diverse student bodies in very different places. And I'm just going to uh, mention, uh, show you one of these, which we put together in my center, the Center for Innovation in, in Learning and Teaching, which in fact turned, we know we put, like everyone else, we put together a huge number of resources. We have an entire page of resources. And it's been really interesting that this one pager has turned out to be one of the most um, uh, uh, downloaded resources. The simple do's and don'ts of communicate frequently, be inclusive, use asynchronous learning. You can actually have engagement with asynchronous learning. Um, do less, not more. Organize, you know, organized and curated and um, well-designed um, lesson plans makes all the difference. Have regular office hours in the same way that you would. Build in feedback. These are clear basic principles that we have found incredibly useful. And of course, they, if you start with those, then everyone benefits. But you're starting with diversity and inclusion at the outset. And um, that's one of the positives that I think has come out of this period. And the other thing that I think has been really valuable has been the growth of universal design. And I, once again, I've just put a couple of principles, but universal design is around learning design, but it's also around content design. So the learning design has been around for quite a long time, but it's come to the fore now. And it's inclusive learning with very practical and sensible approaches to variety, to context, to multimodality, to building on existing knowledge, to multiple opportunities, languages and modes and so on. And that I think has made a huge difference. And once again, if you start with universal design, it benefits everyone. So if you start with equity, it benefits everyone. And I, that's actually where I want to stop because I'm hoping that, um, that these kinds of points will generate uh, questions. So what I'm saying is, please, let's, let's talk about this. You know, how do we marry the dystopia that I mentioned with the opportunities for inclusion and for addressing inequality? So let's talk about that. And, and I'll stop with that. Thank you very much, Laura, for uh, responding very clearly to, to the <laughs> questions. And at the same time, I think that, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a dialogue between what are the opportunities and what are the challenges. And I think that you put it very nicely in the way that you're saying, actually, this pandemic has really been a magnifying glass in terms of inequalities. But yet at the same time, it is also an opportunity to, to conceive new ways of addressing it and to be more in, inclusive. So I think that's, that's a very nice uh, way of putting it. And I hope that uh, people from the audience will also have questions for Laura to take this uh, conversation forward. Before we go into this uh, interactive part, it is also my pleasure to turn now to Mexico and uh, Francisco has been up very early already, but it is still early in, in Mexico. And um, it is my very uh, big pleasure to introduce to you Francisco Cervantes Perez, who is the rector of the International University of La Rioja in Mexico. And we are now moving from a campus-based uh, residential universities, as it is the case for Zhejiang and the University of Cape Coast, to a, a purely online university. And Francisco, we are very uh, pleased to have you on board as well. And as I said, the question is whether for you it's more about business as usual, because while other universities have turned to the use of online teaching and learning, that is kind of the basic principle of an online university. So we look forward uh, to hearing your presentation as well. So you're welcome to share your screen and open the mic. The, microphone is still muted so we just need to 
have that yes. one on mute. Yes, that was yeah. better. Now as we I can hear you. you. Yeah, as I told you, I have my granddaughter in here, so I had to put the microphone on mute. Yeah, she's very noisy, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I uh, thank you and Hillich for the invitation. And uh, because we have uh, a small amount of time, I will start with the presentation. Let me... Well, the, the, the advantage of being the last, uh, I think it is, uh, is uh, that I will skip some of the slides because uh, Jen Lee and Laura already talk about some of the topics. And, uh, and also I, I would like to, to say that yesterday was the, the International Women's Day, so congratulations to you all. I think I'm, I'm in, in this advantage in this meeting. <laughs> But anyway, congratulations to, to all the, the women all, all over the world. Well, let me start by saying that the university is not isolated. The university is uh, always part of a society and the outcome of what the university does uh, contributes to the evolution of society. But in return, the, these uh, changes in society due to the work done by the universities and from um, to other things that happen within the society uh, create the need for the university to also change on time. And uh, I think uh, what we had learned last year is that we must uh, learn faster than we were doing before. Because uh, all these uh, closed loop interaction of the universities with all the sectors of uh, all the, uh, with the rest of the society, it's modulated by predictable and unpredictable social and natural events. Okay, migrations, wars, pandemics, etc. So in this uh, context, uh, universities, uh, uh, it doesn't matter if they are public, private, online or traditional, all, all universities must change. And we have to take into account that we were moving uh, on, uh, I think, for the last 50 years. The, the fourth industrial revolution has uh, caused many changes that, that have forced universities to, to modify uh, the, their educational models, their infrastructure, their, or their organization, and with the pandemic, the, uh, as Laura said, uh, accelerated things and exposed uh, some things that were hidden uh, in our daily, daily work. And, and I think uh, in Latin America, is, uh, pretty, it's, I think it's very much the same situation as in Africa. So inequalities, I think Latin America is the most unequal region in the world. We have a, a, a social uh, classes distribution, which is very unequal. 60% of, of our population in Mexico is in poverty. Okay, only 6% belongs to the high society. And uh, I think um, the pandemic yeah, not only exposed it, but made it worse. So we had a setback in poverty and we are now like we were 12 years ago in poverty and 20 years in extreme poverty situation. So uh, I think it's urgent for everybody to, to, to start a movement um, that takes us to, the, the, to a well, wellness situation for everybody. So we uh, agree with Laura that universities should play an important role in seeking, re to seeking this, this uh, uh, inclusion and, uh, and social justice uh, for everybody. Um, um, Trini uh, gave me this phrase, uh, if for us it was business as usual. And uh, at most, I must say that uh, if we, if we're talking about the substantive activities in the university, the answer is yes. 
uh, we were doing um, our work uh, in an internal internationalization scheme, creating a learning uh, ecosystem. Uh, we are we were trying to learn fast uh, at all levels, and we work on a continuous innovation and research uh, approach, and we collaborate. Uh, and I I'm proud to say that uh, even though we are a private university, we work very closely with a public uh, higher education institution in Mexico with the National Autonomous University of Mexico, in Guatemala with the University of San Carlos, uh, with the National University, Autonomous University of Honduras, and in Nicaragua uh, with the National Autonomous University of Nicaragua in Managua. In Ecuador, we work with 24 public universities. So we're, we're very close uh, to the public education. Um, we uh, we are part of a, a, an ecosystem that has uh, universities in Latin America and different countries in the States and also in Spain. Uh, we have students from 90 countries in all continents. Uh, so we we are really trying to to get education to everybody in a very affordable way. And I should say that uh, at, at UNIR, Everybody is a long live learner. Not only uh, our students, but also our professors, our uh, computer agents, the administrators, uh, the authorities, and I think the, the university as a whole is also a learning organ organization. Uh, in order to do that, we use uh, technology. We have a department that, uh, uh, they work on gathering, organizing, analyzing data, and to uh, generate reports that help uh, the decision-making processes in the academics, in the administration, and also in the communications and business uh, areas. Um, research for us is very important, and we work in a close loop between the education disciplines and the technological disciplines. The education sets for uh, challenges and requirements, and then the technology people works on developing um, educational service systems based on digital technologies. We're now working on developing customizable virtual environments and intelligent tutoring systems for supporting personalized uh, education for all of our, our students. Um, Learning teaching, uh, the learning teaching processes is at the center of all the other activities uh, within the university. And uh, everything is developed uh, in order to help them to, to get a good education. They interact with many people, with the teachers uh, that deliver online courses and work with them in a, an interactive uh, way. And also, the, we have another uh, um, profile, the tutor profile, who uh, stays closely to the students since the beginning of the program until the end. And also, they have environments uh, within our virtual environments where they can learn from other students. So peer learning is, I think, one of the, the, the very important parts of, uh, in the student's formation. Um, and also we work to help teachers and students. So, for example, we have a project in which we use uh, knowledge engineering, um, understanding of uh, natural language and uh, neural computing to help uh, teachers to assess the participation of students in forums and in collaborative activities within their programs. So in that way, we, we're using the innovation we develop in, in the research, research part into the teaching learning activities. Um, I apologize because this slide, I couldn't change it, but we follow an approach. The first part, the, the analytic, in the analytic, analytic phase, we try to know better our students. 
we we try to gather information about their profiles uh, cognitive, academic, uh, the use of technology, the emotional uh, profile, and also their, capa their, their capabilities in managing the language, the math, the, math, the uh, algorithm algorithmics, and also other languages. And we use uh, the, all this knowledge in order to, to, to carry out, uh, during the strategic phase, the, the management of their learning and also the management of, of their emotional uh, situation. And we try to use this to, to work with students in the metacognition level, so we can help them to learn to learn better. Okay? Um, our teachers work with, uh, with many students, and what, what we want them to, to, to do is to design um, learning experiences for our students in a way that our students will be able to, to work in a local uh, environment, in the national environment, in the regional environment, or in the global environment, okay? Uh, in order for, to do that, our teachers are always under a continuous formation in new topics. And, and the idea is that in the, in the near future, our professors working with the uh, um, learning engineers will be able to teach computers to teach. So the computers can help them to teach some parts of the courses, uh, but with the same as, uh, teaching strat strat with their own, um, with the same teaching strategies that they use with uh, their students. And also they will be able to, to build intelligent tutoring systems that will expand uh, professors' capabilities, not to substitute them, but to, to give them um, more, uh, I don't know, more time to do the, the more semantical work with the students, uh, etc. And also to, to, to teach students or to help students to learn, to learn better, okay? Um, also, uh, one, one uh, important uh, part of uh, our uh, academic people work is collaboration. And uh, as Hillish said, we see collaboration as a, a competition plus cooperation activities. It's not only cooperation. Sometimes we have to compete in order to convince other people that what we're proposing is better than what they are proposing or things like that. And once we agree on something, then we, we, we start cooperating to, to make it happen. And also this collaboration uh, is important to say that in Latin America, uh, we have uh, uh, academic associations of uh, higher education institutions like the Union of Universities in Latin America and in the Caribbean, where we can, we can we work together to, to develop programs that we were not able uh, to, do, to do it by ourselves. But we have to work uh, with other universities and also with, um, well, not, not only with other uh, universities, but also with the uh, governments and the civil society in, in our region. And uh, in these projects, I think one of the best uh, things is that we, we work under the quality culture. So we, we offer the best we have uh, in order to participate in these uh, projects. And um, with the, the Ibero-American States uh, Organization and with uh, other universities in, and ministries of education, we are offering free uh, courses and diplomats uh, for teachers and for teachers in uh, all educational levels. For example, in, in Ecuador, we are uh, working with 800 uh, teachers in the basic education level. Uh, so they they can um, learn how to use technology in in education, and also to improve their uh, their didactic uh, um, capability to teach the language, 
which is very important to understand what, what you're doing or to argument, to defend your ideas. And also uh, in the, the didactics of science and math, uh, I think the students, when they learn uh, well, uh, scientific approaches and these mathematics, they, they learn to think uh, in an organized uh, uh, way. So we work with, with teachers to, to improve their capabilities in that sense. And uh, I, I couldn't be, uh, I couldn't agree more with, with Laura in that the, the inclusion part of education is quite important. And I think the starting point is to know better our students, take into, into account its diversity and also um, their complexity. Uh, it's, not only, it's not only a diverse population, but it's also a very complex one. And in uh, online education, uh, we started in, in the past by giving everybody the same, the same, the same things. And that didn't work. The same for all uh, doesn't work. So we have to, to give everybody what, what uh, they need in order to be successful. And that is what the economists call the positive discrimination, which is very good. In the meantime, uh, because we would like to, to reach a situation where education will give a, um, uh, will develop an um, educational model that will be good for everybody without doing, without doing anything uh, in particular for, for some of the people. And with that, I, I think I will stop my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Francisco, for sharing your perspective from an online university and also including this very important dimension of uh, how to be more inclusive and actually also responding to, to Laura's uh, point of view. And uh, now that we have uh, gone through all these three different perspectives, uh, we are ready to, to start a, a conversation. So let me just remind participants that you're very welcome to ask some questions in the Q&A or, or in the chat. I think that Hillage is following uh, both uh, sides on that and she will come in a little bit later with a few questions for you. To start up, off uh, the conversation, um, I mean, you're very welcome as well, of course, to react and to comment on the, uh, each other's uh, presentations. You will each uh, get the floor again. Uh, so uh, you have the opportunity as well to react to your fellow panelists here uh, in, in this webinar. But I would like to, to, to build on something that you mentioned, uh, Francisco, the fact that you're striving to use technologies to enhance uh, the, the learning or to free up uh, time for professors or teachers to, to, to engage differently with students. And that actually reminded me of a question that I would like to put forward to Yan Li and Laura, uh, in the sense that you are representing uh, residential uh, universities or campus-based universities. Um, will this uh, period that we have gone through where we're not able to meet. I mean, I think that we all know humans are social beings. So I think that we, we want to meet again. I think that we are not in an era where uh, residential universities will re be replaced and all universities are online. I think that we are in an era where there is room for both. I think that they, they, they are complementary and uh, I think that it, it, it will continue in this way. So my questions to you is more will we think differently about the time that we spend on campus, the type of uh, exchanges that we have with students? Are we going to, to, to think differently? For example, uh, I think one of the, the, the examples that were also uh, put in, in, in your survey, uh, Yan Li, was the fact that uh, some material is actually um, easier to have through a video that you can see uh, when you have the time, you can actually replay it if there are passages that you would need to listen to several times compared to a lecture in a huge auditorium with a lot of people where you're not be able to necessarily interact. Will we see changes in that sense that the time that we use as 
the teachers, instructors, professors on campus and the time with the, the students will change? Or do you think that it, it is the same model that will, will continue? Yan Lee, I will give you the floor first and then move to you, uh, Laura. Okay. Uh, at the now, uh, in our university, uh, most of the students, especially those Chinese students, they are all on campus. We are using, uh, we, we, we say after last year's experience, uh, we encourage uh, every uh, instructors to use blind, blinded uh, uh, teaching and learning format instead of a uh, very traditional face-to-face, -face. but uh, um, our main students are on campus. Uh, there are maybe still uh, those uh, some of in, uh, in international students. They are still maybe at home. So we use the uh, online uh, uh, teaching format to to uh, teach those uh, international students. Uh, as to the the time, you mean the students their use of time. I, I, I don't know if I get the clear Well, question. I was just thinking whether you would uh, think differently about how you use the presence on campus. So the, 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 the time that you have with the students, uh, will they be used more for interactions rather than lectures? Or, I mean, in that sense, are we going to think differently about uh, the time that we spend physically together compared to the time that would be maybe covered by, by distance? Maybe not. It, it's just an open question. Okay. Uh, as, as I observe, I uh, found uh, maybe uh, for different uh, instructors, uh, they, they, uh, they, they are changed uh, differently. Because uh, uh, for some, maybe they just uh, uh, go back to their traditional way to teach face-to-face <laughs> the situation. But uh, for some uh, instructors, after last year's online teaching, they reflected, they feel there are some benefits of uh, online parts uh, instruction. So they will, uh, they will guide uh, more, uh, more of the say, they will, uh, in, uh, they will uh, ask the students to uh, to use more online uh, resources, online like a uh, uh, chat uh, chatting board, uh, online uh, tools, yeah, and uh, and also our information uh, 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 information technology center actually last year uh, I built. They uh, made a huge contribution to our whole university's uh, we call informationalization. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, the 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 basic facilit uh, uh, facilitators and also the online platform. And they uh, co uh, collaborate uh, collaborate with uh, uh, Ali. Uh, ding 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 ding. We use ding ding. Uh, so, so there are uh, close connections with uh, outside uh, companies who, uh, and also they uh, they actually last in uh, during previous uh, months. Also, they uh, create or developed some online collaborative uh, learning and uh, uh, research platform for. Uh, our students and uh, for uh, teachers. So I think uh, uh, some instructors, they changed a lot, maybe some, uh, not so many. Okay, yeah, and I think that as you also mentioned, I mean, we're also hearing from many that the, the future is blended. It's, it's a matter of different uh, approaches as well. Laura, do you want to react to this as well? Sure. One thing we can't um, pretend, there are some academics who want to go back to the way things were. So those of us who work in pedagogy and who are interested in the opportunities and so on must accept that 
for some people, they want to wait until this is all over and go back to business as usual. And that's true. But I do think that, as uh, Yan Li was saying, there are certain practices that will become more normal. So things that were esoteric in the past, like flipped classrooms, people are starting to see the benefits. Um, so some of those practices will be enacted. But, you know, one of the things that's interested me with a, an equity eye is that we've been forced to problematize equity and realize that for some people being online is an equity issue. So for certain categories of students, it is safer to be online. For students who are shy or who um, maybe on the autism spectrum or um, whatever, it actually, uh, even perhaps sometimes students who have a language uh, lack of confidence confidence and the asynchronicity gives them an opportunity. So we're also going to have to problematize our thinking about these kind of neat categories. I think that's one thing we've learned is that it's not neat. Um, I, I love Francisco's um, images and I, I've used them too. But in fact, what we've learned from this is that it's much more nuanced than we had um, anticipated. Thank you very much. Uh, Laura, for coming in here as well. Uh, Francisco, so in your case, it's not about returning to, to a campus-based uh, uh, situation because you continue uh, developing and, and seeking ways of providing quality uh, online education and reaching out to, to, to your student population. And maybe this is where I want to take the question to you. Uh, are you seeing uh, changes in the, in, the, in the type of students that you have? I mean, in my experience with fully online universities is that they are often catering to a slightly um, uh, older uh, uh, yeah. students, uh, part of more the lifelong learning uh, track rather than the ones uh, entering university following high school, et cetera. So maybe, uh, it would be interesting to hear from you what you have observed on that front. My, my thinking is, does this experience actually lead to more young students to also seek those types of opportunities or will we continue to have a different, uh, di different targets in terms of student bodies? Okay. Um, you're right. Uh, I think like 10 years ago, uh, the average age uh, in uh, online students was around 33 years of age. Um, but uh, that has changed uh, during the last five years, uh, even before the COVID-19. Um, and uh, uh, I have an example from uh, my previous work uh, at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, we developed a high school online program in 2007. In, uh, in those years, uh, the, um, only 1% of the applicants uh, were young people in the age of entering the high school. But by um, 2018, I think uh, around 50% of the applicants were in that, uh, that sector of the, 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 uh, the of age. So that has changed even before COVID-19. And uh, Laura asked me if, uh, what, uh, what, we, what we have to do in order to cope with COVID-19. Uh, in teaching and learning, Actually, we did nothing different. Our students and teachers uh, kept on working as uh, business as usual, as you said to me a few days uh, before. <clears throat> so in that way, I think um, our population is changing. So if, uh, actually I used to build a, a graph and we have very, very few young students and uh, then the, the graph goes up and they, it goes down up to 84 years of age. Uh, and the, the peak of the curve is moving towards the left. That means uh, more younger people is uh, getting into online uh, uh, programs in the undergraduate and in the high school levels. Uh, I think for the, the master's programs and, 
uh, specialities and, uh, and continuing education is the case, that, as, as you said. It's uh, older people who, who seek for uh, online education uh, based on many reasons. Uh, most of them, uh, most of our students work full time, have full time jobs. They have family. They have some uh, very formal obligations. And that's the, 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 the online education is the best way for them to keep on learning. And, uh, and I think uh, we, in the future, we will still be having older people in online programs. But as I told you, I think we will see more and more younger people get and enrolled in, in online programs. Um, in our countries, uh, if we talk about the, these 60% of people uh, living in poverty, uh, they have to work and study uh, if they want to, do, to, to get a better education. So in that way, I think for most of our population, uh, this, uh, this online education will also be the best, the best opportunity to, to uh, escalate socially and economically in, in their lives. So I, I think, and, and uh, I want to, to make a comment on what the other questions you did to Laura and, and Jen Lee, because I was uh, uh, before in a traditional university. Um, People uh, shouldn't go back to the old normal. So the new normal has to be a mixture of uh, the advantages offered by the different modalities. We cannot uh, keep on uh, having exercise uh, classes, presential classes. Um, teachers shouldn't be doing reading uh, within the class. Uh, uh, so there are many activities uh, in the traditional educational model that can be taken out of the, the classroom. And uh, students uh, get bored. Uh, I don't know if they experience in other parts of the world, but uh, when I was teaching, some of our students use the Walkman and they connect the, uh, the earphones and they disconnect from the class. Uh, because some others have difficulties understanding what you're explaining. So the diversity of our students make it, makes it uh, very difficult for the teacher to keep the attention of all of, of the students within the classroom. So we have, as Laura said, to move on to a new normal. And I think that's the challenge. What is the new normal for a specific university or for a specific school within a university, I think that will depend on the program, on the students, on the teachers and on the technological infrastructure of the university. So it's a very complex problem that needs to be addressed uh, individually at all universities. So a move towards more student-centered learning where there is room to take into consideration the, the diversity to, to offer another type of uh, inclus inclusion. That's also what you're suggesting, Laura. Hilid, you've been following the, the, the questions, I think, on the chat. So maybe you want to, to come in here and, and, and pose a few of those. I would like to start by thanking um, all the speakers for this these very interesting uh, uh, comments on uh, complex issues that actually will lead us into a, a transformation of the future of teaching and learning as well. Uh, there are a few questions in the chat um, and some of them uh, are more technical, others are more on content. One of the more technical questions was relating to the issue of security when teaching online, but not only the teaching, but actually examinations. And people were wondering how is how did you deal or would you have suggestions as to how to offer um, platforms or mechanisms or means 
<coughs> for exams to be taken in such a way that um, the university is sure that the student sitting and taking the exam is the right one <laughs> and that uh, the, um, the, uh, the way in which the exam is being taken um, is also uh, appropriate uh, given um, all the different uh, issues that are at stake when taking an exam. So that's more of a, a technical one. And, and another one also related to technical so that I, I bundle them a bit is the one on uh, blended classrooms or flipped classrooms. People were asking if you would have any recommendation there. There was a, a very technical uh, question which is more of a I would say of um, uh, communications one, would there be any platform more suitable than another one, but that's making publicity for others. So I don't think that we, <laughs> we can really go there, uh, but at the same, same time, it's interesting. And on these topics, at the same time, I will ask the question from a research perspective, what have you come across on these two points? Uh, from a pedagogical perspective also, how to actually um, ensure that students take, uh, take on their responsibility as students in, um, in this difficult period and ensure themselves that they are actually actors of their own education and thus avoid cheating which is a very broad agenda. Um, and as well, maybe how can a, a fully online university assist brick and mortar universities in, um, in improving even into the future, uh, the teaching and learning uh, methodologies? And have you, for instance, uh, uh, Francisco being called upon by universities in Mexico to assist in making this move towards another kind of teaching and learning because it is different as Laura said. You have those who resist and you have those who are fully uh, on board and, and want to learn more how they can improve their own teaching and learning. So technical questions and maybe uh, I will start with Yan Li and then there are a few other questions that I can also uh, pick from, uh, from the chat. Then Lee, then Francisco, then Laura, if you please. <laughs> okay, uh, about uh, how to uh, how to evaluate, right? How to uh, <laughs> uh, the technical. Uh, actually, last year, uh, the people, the those staffs uh, in the uh, information technology center of our university really communicated uh, several times with me about uh, how to deal with uh, students' cheating issues. Uh, like, so uh, it's a huge challenge for, for them. So uh, like uh, there are large scale, uh, for some uh, large scale uh, classes for like our English uh, courses, English and uh, some uh, courses almost all grade, uh, like uh, all freshmen, all sophomore need to take. So there's large scale uh, examinations. So really uh, they, uh, they had uh, some, uh, some, some, how to say, uh, methods because uh, like uh, uh, they, they use uh, uh, some, uh, some skills of, they control uh, students uh, screen like the, the uh, platform uh, they they cannot uh, uh, click another uh, yeah just uh, focus on the screen otherwise they will uh, they will uh, be cheated uh, like cheating so uh, you need to uh, tell uh, students once log in the system your um, um, the mouse the, you, you cannot leave the screen, otherwise you will be cheated, <laughs> uh, cheating. Yes, so this very, is very, very, uh, very complex issue, huh, eh? Yan Li? <laughs> yes. And also they need to use, uh, they, they need to open their video, the, the video. They need to show their uh, behavior. So really, uh, there are many staffs uh, were invited to involve them to uh, to uh, how to say <laughs> uh, monitor to, yeah monitor <laughs> the whole situation there are many uh, cameras uh, at the distance so this is what 
uh, our university do during the final uh, exam the, the, the week. Yeah, and uh, I noticed the question about uh, the uh, the blended classroom. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, now or one year before. Uh, I say I think it's now maybe. It's now. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, many of our uh, teach, uh, instructors, uh, really after last year's online experience, uh, they uh, they are used to uh, blended uh, learning or teaching uh, format. Like uh, for me, uh, even before 2020, all of my courses are blended. Yes, we use uh, online platform and also uh, because uh, we have uh, the learning platform in our cell phone. So uh, we, will, we will, like in, during class, uh, I will use uh, on, uh, in class quiz uh, in our platform. So maybe uh, the first five minutes, I say we, we, we need to have a quiz uh, to test what, what you have learned the last uh, week. <laughs> so they were, uh, but uh, uh, at the, uh, in the beginning of the semester, I will uh, tell students, uh, like uh, uh, we will have in-class quiz. And also I will use the online uh, collaborative platform to, uh, to do some group activities. And also they need to, uh, they need to, uh, they, uh, they, they need to uh, make a presentation about uh, how their uh, collaborative work, uh, I mean, uh, done during the whole uh, weekend. So we use the online collaborative uh, platform to uh, ask them to do uh, work. And also during class, I ask them to show their results. So uh, blended, uh, uh, learning is always happened uh, in my uh, in my courses, but uh, really it's not uh, happened in all of my or in all of my university's uh, other uh, courses. So I think uh, the, the dynamics of blend, blended classroom. I don't know how to. <laughs> It's still yeah. complicated, but maybe we can hear then from uh, Francisco a bit about that, if there is any blended uh, opportunity there. You would have two minutes and Laura too as well, so that I can ask the last question. Time is ticking. Thank you okay. very much, Sean Lee. That was very good. Uh, thank you. Francisco? Okay. Um, well, uh, first thing, um, assessment is divided in, in different parts. Exams are one of the... Uh, uh, one, one part of the assessment. And for that, we use technology. Uh, we use two different types of technology. The one is that locks down the, the computers, the, the student's computer, and converts it into a, a kind of an old computer terminal for our servers. So the student won't be able to access to anything within its computer. And the other uh, technology is the, the video recording that analyzes images. So anything, any behavior that uh, shows that he's cheating is taken into account to, to cancel the exam and to give the students uh, a, non, uh, a zero grade. So in that way, uh, exams, uh, I think uh, the, te the technology we're using is uh, improving uh, Every time it's better and better, so we get a better, we get more confident on on what we are doing during the examination. Also, some part of the grades uh, it's uh, gained by the students by working with other students. So it would be disastrous for a university that all of our students were cheaters. Okay, so. In that way, uh, uh, our, uh, <laughs> our, our own students help to, to avoid cheating. Um, so that's in the first, uh, the first part. I think it's an issue, but uh, things are getting better and better. Uh, the flipped uh, approach, the fli flipped classroom. Um, when I went to the university, we used to learn by studying before the class. And during the class, uh, 
working with our professors. And after we learn, uh, the professor gave us some stuff to do to consolidate our learning. And I think uh, when the people talk about flip uh, classroom, you can switch the activities. You can learn online and then you can, you can consolidate uh, your learning with the professor. And I think in that way, the, the face to face, face activities will have a different uh, learning objective. And in that way, uh, you can optimize the, the, the timing and during the presential uh, uh, part of the education and the students will have the freedom to learn at any time, anywhere, with any device. Or they, they will be uh, in a situation where they can learn uh, much better than they did before within a classroom, within a scheduled time and very fixed things. So I think in, in that way, um, that might be one of many possibilities for defining the new normal uh, after COVID uh, uh, will be controlled. And I was wondering if so, your university was invited by others to help develop new uh, approaches and new pedagogies when you're an old brick and mortar and you have many of those uh, resisting scholars uh, not ready yet to move online or not, not capacitated. Were you during yes. the pandemic very quickly? Because I would like to give a little yeah. bit of- Yes, more. yes, we did. I, I told you we, we were working with uh, the public universities in Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, and in Mexico. Yes. And one of the, the, the collaborative projects we have was to, to work with teachers. So we, exactly. can, we can share with them what our teachers are doing. Also, many of our teachers or our professors are, are working in, in traditional universities. And in that way, uh, where they, uh, we prepare them to work online. And so that, that formation helps them to, to do the same within the, the other universities where they are working. Uh, and sometimes uh, they share what they know with their colleagues. And so it's um, like a, uh, an expansion bomb uh, by doing this uh, this kind of job, but formally we good we bomb, though. <laughs> 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 yes, <laughs> very good. But we 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 do work with uh, uh, traditional with universities, especially public universities. Thank you so much. Okay. That's very interesting because that's new, probably as well. Or you said you had worked with them in the past. Again, time is going too fast. I would like to turn to Laura. You have seen as well that uh, uh, one of the, the participants uh, thanks you specifically on introducing the notion of low tech um, uh, provision of higher education. Uh, and also on the, uh, the very topic of inclusion as was also uh, picked up uh, by other of, uh, speakers and, uh, and by Trina in, in her comments. So if you could also maybe quickly get back to those two questions, maybe not necessarily on, on the cheating because, well, we, I think the Yan Li and uh, Francisco responded to that one, but on, on the new pedagogies that uh, can, be, uh, can be used. And you will see on our social media, I already shared some of the pictures of your presentations to tease them into looking at your uh, at this webinar and your presentations uh, and I think that your table Laura with the pros and cons will be uh, will be a very good one for everybody to use uh, in and put in their uh, in their to-do list <laughs> so if you would get back to on on those two on those questions and questions you've seen um, yeah, I would just like to say that the question of online exams, as you said, Hilliger, is very contentious. Mm -hmm. I think that the question of proctoring has been extremely vexatious. And yeah. one of the positive things to go back to Trina is that it has really catalyzed a reflection on new forms of assessment. And mm -hmm. that's, very, that's very welcome. So I yeah. think that's really good. And I hope that doesn't get lost. I think that's uh, been very healthy. The second thing, and probably the last thing I will have a chance to say, is that what online proctoring has also catalyzed is a discussion about the datification of student experiences. And um, 
I think that data literacies, in fact, probably, I mean, students, but also academics, really one thing that's going to come out of this period is the question of datification and how data is used and how data is feeding current business models. So the fact that Turnitin sold for over 1.3 billion US dollars is indicative of the value of that student data. And one of the really difficult things is, is finding the time to understand what's happening in universities. And that goes back to your question, Hilliger, about research. I would argue that one of the high, most uh, the priority areas is to understand the, the impact of the digital and business models on student experiences and what's happening to student data. Yep. And, and to grow data literacies. And I think that's all I have time to say. <laughs> the other question I will then leave with you and with the audience, because it was part and parcel of the problems that you also highlighted when moving online, is this uh, homogenization of content, possibly, uh, and how to ensure that the future will allow for a diversity of views to be shared, and certainly for very diverse knowledge systems to continue to be connected through higher education, and thus not for certain types of knowledge systems to become the norm uh, because it's easier and they're already on, on uh, digital devices and can be accessed easily, but to ensure that the variety and multiplicity of voices are heard. But I can only leave that with everyone as a reflection for a next discussion, possibly as well, because that ties into uh, the opportunity of an open university to connect knowledge systems through uh, these, this wealth of, of information that is available out there, through the research that you do in a university either in China or in South Africa, where the new pedagogies will also allow for inclusion of diverse approaches, uh, different perspectives on things, uh, and to certainly not forget about about those dynamics because it is true and you've said it all that the online dynamics also come with a challenge to time and how to ensure that the, the time allows for this diversity to be part of, uh, of future education as well because we are being uh, connecting from very early till very late so we need to keep straight in our minds that we, we need to be very strong uh, as well in, in th those dynamics. Did we lose uh, the group, Trina? No, okay, we're still there. So we close here with two last slides. First, I've, with Trina uh, and with the IAU, we're really thanking you very much for your wonderful presentations. The recordings will may be made available within the next coming days uh, with the participants, with those who registered and with you, if you want to share in your networks. And um, so I would like to bring two other things to your attention. The fact that the IEU is carrying out this global survey on the various impact of COVID-19 on higher education around the world. This is the second edition. The first one was um, uh, last year. And this is the second one that is looking at midterm impact of COVID-19 and will benchmark where we are today on all the dynamics, including those we debated today. And then we would like to hope to invite you all to be part of this and share in your networks, because what will be important is to have as many responses as possible so that the uh, report that will result from it, where all of your universities will be cited, will feed into the UNESCO World Higher Education Conference with important information to help build the roadmap uh, into the future. So please uh, invite your uh, university leadership to look at the COVID um, survey and to take it because that will allow to have better data. You were talking about data for students. We need data on what is happening. And so that will be uh, very important as well. And then the last slide is to bring to your attention uh, the fact that we have a next webinar 
on various uh, different aspects um, impacted by COVID, uh, including uh, government uh, plans for the future or looking at um, the ways in which a university will address COVID in a specific, specific way. And um, we, with, uh, with an international uh, consortium, have uh, worked on the publication of a new book on higher education's responses to COVID-19 uh, and how to build a more sustainable and democratic future altogether. So we hope to welcome some or all of you to that uh, next webinar as well. So I'll leave it at this. Uh, we have overspent <laughs> your patience and time. Trina, do you want to say a last word? The word is yours. Thank you very just much. To, <laughs> I just want to, of course, as you, Hilich, thank you, uh, the speakers, for your excellent presentations. It was a pleasure uh, working with you here, and I hope that our conversations will continue far beyond. And also thank you for the participants for for taking part and posing your questions and we will definitely continue this conversation uh, for, uh, beyond the webinar. So thank you all for taking part. Thank you. <laughs> Have a nice day, evening, night. <laughs> <laughs> you too. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye.